Hello, and welcome to The Cost of Glory. This is Alex Petkus. Thanks for joining. I hope you're doing well. You know, of the men that we've covered so far in this podcast, Sulla is probably the most notorious in the later eyes of history. And that's saying something, if you consider that he's up against other forceful and imposing characters like Lysander of Sparta and Sulla's great opponent, Marius. But even though most readers of history, when they think of Sulla, they're going to think of the bloody civil wars, the proscriptions, they think of him reviving the office of dictator, there still are, nonetheless, many people who've studied the man carefully and actually admire him. The famous historian of Rome, Theodore Mommsen, the Nobel laureate of 1902, well, he wrote that, quote, in fact, Sulla is one of the most marvelous characters. We may even say a phenomenon unique in history. And Mommsen went so far as to say that Sulla deserved to be compared with George Washington for his willingness to yield his own power for the greater good of the people that he represented. Eventually, that is, and he's talking about when he laid down his dictatorship a year before he died. Well, whatever your notion of that statement or of Sulla himself, there's no doubt that for ambitious people, a man who made a dent in the world as big as Sulla did deserves to be studied and analyzed. So what are some of the key qualities that produced Sulla's successes and can we emulate them? Well, I've got five for you. Number one. Well, one thing that's really foundational for Sulla is his complete confidence in himself. He always felt that the gods were on his side, and he was never embarrassed to admit that he was lucky. If anything, he thought that it signaled he was worth following. He was the team to be on. But his faith in the divine providence was not something that had come to him by standing and praying in a temple until he felt some mystical power wash over him. He won it out in the field, taking real risks, like his daring mission to bait and capture Jugurtha by betrayal early on in his career in Numidia. Sulla was a brave man, and he took personal risks on the battlefield, like so many great ancient commanders, like many great modern leaders too, Napoleon, Hamilton, Lawrence of Arabia. You remember at the Battle of Orchomenus, that trench-digging operation where Sulla got attacked and his lines were starting to buckle and he, he jumped on his horse and he rallied his troops personally by riding up and grabbing a flag and charging the enemy. So there you go, complete confidence. And if you want to lead effectively, you really need a lot of confidence. And the strongest basis of confidence is physical courage. And you can develop this through faith and various spiritual traditions, or you can develop it through putting yourself through appropriate dangers when duty calls. I think preferably you'd want to have some of both. Now, secondly, Sulla was very good at connecting with the common and the lowly. And we've seen at many points how he made very bold demands on his soldiers, especially on their loyalty. More than once, he asked them to do things that might be viewed as illegal or unpatriotic or just wrong in the eyes of some at least. And to do that requires extraordinary gifts of persuasion and charisma in a leader, and also a lot of trust from your followers. And Sulla built his ability to get that trust and to have that gift of persuasion by getting down and comfortable with regular people. He would talk business with them, trade dirty jokes with them, with the rank and file. And of course, he enjoyed the refined pleasures like literature and art and poetry too. But, you know, he really loved to drink and party and tell stories. He was just a folksy guy. And this gave him a good instinct for his men's morale and how to raise it when he needed to. And of course, he needed to on many occasions. In order to win a fight where the deck is heavily stacked against you, you need a major morale advantage over your opponent's. And Sulla got that by relating personally to his troops, and also by setting the example, as we already talked about, with his own personal courage, by taking risks alongside them, which really makes people look up to you. So when Sulla asks his troops to take on big risks, for example, turn around and march on Rome for that first time at Nola, when he was consul after Marius tried to deprive him of his command, 
He had already spent years laying the groundwork, and he had so much trust from them and intuition for their motives that he was able to make the coup seem like their idea. And another thing that Sulla realized with his troops is when you feel like it's you and your team against the world, that can be an incredibly galvanizing and uniting feeling. And it will make you very open to believing that your side is the one with the good guys on it, that you have some kind of higher mission. So once you push people over that edge and get them to commit it's a little easier psychologically to sustain that rebel spirit. So if you can find a way to create that spirit of us versus the world at a company that you're working at or leading or a project that you're running or a movement, that's a very powerful asset. Thirdly, Sulla was a great master of spectacle and drama and propaganda and this is really one of his essential leadership qualities, I think. You know, tricking Jugurtha into believing that this Roman was taking the Numidian bait. When Sulla controlled all the reports about battle losses. And remember that great, horrific scene where the executions of the Civil War prisoners became the background music to his speech before the Senate, after he had finally won the Civil War. Sulla knew how to orchestrate a show to make exactly the impression he wanted and needed at that moment. And that's a very powerful leadership and success skill to kind of event manage. And in a way, you could say that this was connected to a fourth advantageous quality of Sulla's. And that was that he was just not that impressed by common notions of what you're supposed to do. He spent a lot of his youth just having fun, partying, dabbling in drama. You weren't supposed to do that if you were ambitious. Sulla was ambitious, but he weighed the costs and the benefits and decided to just do what he wanted. He didn't care what people thought. And if a plebiscite passes a law, even an unjust law, depriving you of your command as consul, you're not supposed to march on the city. You could think again of Sulla's contempt for Mithridates as pomp and circumstance. It's as though since Sulla knew shows and drama as well as he did, he saw through all the social dramas and acts that we participate in, and he recognized that many people are just terrified of breaking character, and this holds them back. And so, often when people were counting on him to play the role that he was supposed to play, it was at those very moments that his willingness to break expectations gave him an advantage. Think of his brutal sack of Athens, or the time at the Battle of Chironea, when he made that bold attack on a much greater and disorganized army. And, of course, you could think of his determined attacks on his enemies in the First Great Roman Civil War. All of these were strongly against expectations. And even his last major public act, laying down the dictatorship, nobody expected that either. That's sort of not what you're supposed to do once you take power. In a way, by doing that, he confounded all the people, both then and for the rest of history, who would want to try to paint him as just a typical tyrant. It was sort of a plausible label, but sort of not. He just didn't quite fit the mold. Finally, like most great generals, including Julius Caesar, Sulla was a master of speed, of keeping the initiative, he said once that of all the actions that he took, it was the ones that he dared on the spur of the moment, out of instinct, almost impulsively, you might say, that those were the ones that turned out better rather than the actions he spent planning in advance. And maybe he was talking about his first revolt as consul when he showed up at the gates of Rome while his opponents were still scrambling. Maybe he had in mind two of his most significant victories in the Civil War, the first against Marius Jr. and the second at the Battle of the Colline Gate. In both of these occasions, he attacked against his lieutenant's better advice. The men were tired. It was late in the day. Sulla, we're not ready. Let's wait till tomorrow. And his enemies on both occasions were probably thinking that he wouldn't do it, which is maybe precisely why he did do it. And it gave him that most precious thing for great leaders, the initiative there are a lot of other things that we could say about Sulla's 
success qualities. You might call them virtues. And if you have other thoughts of your own, why don't you write me at alex at ancientlifecoach.com. I love to hear from listeners. But besides the virtues, obviously you could say a lot about Sulla's weaknesses and his vices. For one thing, the impression you get from the sources is that once he became the first man in Rome, supremely powerful after the Civil War, and when he was ultimately responsible, in one way or another, for basically every public act happening because he was at the top of the pyramid, that he just went on with his usual routine of working hard by day and then partying hard by night, around age 60. And all the while, abuses were happening in his name. His cronies were having innocent people murdered so that they could plunder their stuff. If ever there was a time for Sulla to double down on self-discipline and exert himself to the fullest to root out corruption and, and really to be a moral example, that was the time. His legacy was on the line. At the very least, I think it's fair to say that he succeeded despite his personal vices and not because of them. Really, if he hadn't been such a heavy drinker and so sexually promiscuous, isn't there a good chance that he would have lived longer? How would history have gone and how would Sulla have been viewed if he had gone on to live to an old age of 76, like the first emperor Augustus later did, with time to oversee Rome's transition into a new order when the storm surges of civil war had time to settle back into a calm sea? Because, in fact, after Sulla died in 78 BC, another war broke out again almost immediately. One of the consuls, who was elected when Sulla was alive, Lepidus, rallied discontent and he led a serious rebellion in Italy. And it shouldn't really surprise us that Sulla's harshness with the civil war and the proscriptions hadn't really settled things very well and maybe even backfired. Many powerful men were happy to support a challenge to the order that he established once he was gone. Lucky for the leaders of Sulla's regime, his veterans came out of their many places of retirement throughout Italy, and they defeated Lepidus pretty quickly. But a war raged on in Spain with the rebellion of Sertorius, who for the better part of a decade set up what ended up being a fully functioning rival state in the West. Sertorius came very close to unwinding the peace of the Civil War, when he was finally killed in 72 BC, letters were found in this rebel's possession from many of the most prominent men of Rome, promising him support if he would march back on the city and kick out Sulla's cronies and undo many of his reforms. For more on all that, read Plutarch's Amazing Life of Sertorius, or listen to the biography on this podcast if you haven't yet. Also check out The Life of Pompey coming soon. And another thing, even Sulla's veteran land grant settlements were a mixed success, to say the least. When thousands of the most well-connected and successful landowners throughout Italy were eliminated, whether it was through the Civil War or the proscriptions, this was massively disrupting to the economy. And many of Sulla's veterans were drawn from the urban poor of Rome or from among kind of random country folk from different parts of Italy, where the soil was different, the weather was different, the language was different. Farming is actually pretty hard, and it's hard in different ways than war is hard. Many of these guys were just not up to the challenge, and they fell into debt, into poverty. And about 18 years after Sulla died, something kind of fascinating happened. The politician Catiline, who you may recall was one of the chief abusers under the proscriptions, well, he talked both these discontented men into following him, these former Sulla soldiers, and many of the survivors of the proscriptions and their children, that is, Sulla's victims. And these people felt excluded from political life at Rome. And Catiline riled up both of these kind of contrasting opposite even groups, and he led another bloody revolt against the establishment at Rome. And that revolt failed too. That's a story for the life of Cicero, who kind of saved the day there as consul in 60 BC. 
But it shows well how unsettled things still were after Sulla's attempts to refound the Roman state, if both his victims and his beneficiaries were somehow scarred by his acts. And even Sulla's signature motion as dictator to practically abolish the tribune of the plebs as a political office, it was undone only eight years after he died by none other than his precocious young former lieutenants, Pompey and Crassus, who were co-consuls that year in 70 BC. And they reestablished the traditional tribunate precisely because the office still had massive popular support and it would be good for their careers politically. So that's one lesson. If you try to change the rules, whether it's at a long-standing business or the constitution of a country, people will remember how it used to be, and they will try to find ways to set it back to the way it was. Well, more on Sulla next episode, where I'm mainly just going to read for you Plutarch's classic comparison of him and Lysander, his counterpart. If you liked this, leave us a review, subscribe to our email list at ancientlifecoach.com. Stay strong, stay ancient. This is Alex Petkus. Until next time.